we uh, just talked about energy, and so we're going to apply that to living things now. And how um, this is kind of jumping off point for what living things do with energy. And the uh, so to start with, uh, pretty much the for most organisms, it's the sun. Uh, then uh, things are converted to chemical energy, and from chemical chemical energy to the molecule or to ATP. And ATP, of course, is used, and we'll learn this a lot more later, to power pretty much everything that happens inside your uh, body. We talked about this before, and inside an organism. Now, there's a couple caveats here. One is that it's not always the sun. There, we've discovered there are some organisms that use other forms of energy. Uh, they're called chemosynthetic, and they live usually at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, down where there is no sun. There are organisms that convert energy of chemicals to another form of chemical energy to ATP. But for our purposes, we're going to talk about the majority of things on Earth. Uh, so the sun to chemical energy, uh, we would call photosynthesis. Okay, and remember, uh, and maybe we didn't really talk about this, is that chemical energy is actually energy contained in the bonds between molecules. So we have a, let's say, a sugar molecule bonded to another sugar molecule. That bond is high energy bond. And that's where the sun's energy is captured into there. And we call that photosynthesis. Uh, the chemical energy contained in bond, those bonds and then being converted to ATP, well, we call that cellular respiration. And... We will be talking about that in some detail also. So, uh, so when we talk about energy, we have to talk about electrons. And you learn in chemistry that electrons exist in energy levels, right? Electrons exist in energy levels. And the farther away you are from the nucleus, the high, that's called a higher energy level. So if we have a nucleus here, and we have energy levels drawn around the nucleus. If you're out here in this energy level, that's higher energy. Well, the other thing we know about electrons is they can zing back and forth between energy levels. And technically, then, if you're an electron and you're nowhere near the nucleus, you're out here somewhere, you're, oh, you're not even part of it anymore. In fact, this is now an ion, and so the electron is gone. That electron is at as high of energy level as it can get. So, um, the second thing about that is that electrons are used to bond things together covalently. In other words, if we have uh, a hydrogen with its one electron, and another hydrogen with its one electron, and then an oxygen molecule with its uh, six electrons, right? I'm going to draw dots here a quick a second. Or six, all right, that these guys will share these two electrons and these guys will share these two electrons to make a water molecule. Those electrons, that sharing, okay, is a high energy bond. Well, in some cases it is. High, that says high energy, sorry, I'm scribbling. A high energy bond. They're called high energy bonds because the electrons are at a higher energy state. That's why they're high energy bonds. The electrons at a higher energy state, they have to be to hold that thing together. When the bond is broken, electrons are released and fall to a lower state. So, okay, let's take a, um, um, a thing like methane. Okay, methane is CH4. Okay, there are electrons here holding, I'm going to just draw them as two dots, so shared chemical bonds, right? If we break this chemical bond, those electrons are released. 
And what happens then is that those electrons fall to a lower state. We say they fall to lower energy. Okay, that's an important idea. Now, if we take methane and we just get it and we uh, provide enough energy to break these bonds, a lot of times we see that falling as heat and light or fire. Okay? So, an electron transport chain is a series of proteins embedded in a membrane. <laughs> this is a lot of stuff. Either in a chloroplast in plants or a mitochondria in both plants and animals. And you may have heard of these two things before. These are parts of a cell or organelles. An electron transport chain slows the fall of electrons from a high energy state to a low energy state. An electron transport chain slows the fall of electrons from high energy to low energy. So this is a, a sketch out of your textbook uh, of an electron transport chain. And this thing right here is something that carries high energy electrons. And those high energy electrons are dropped off here. They're dropped here and then they're passed along. And they're shown on this angle from here. This talks about the amount of free energy. Free energy in those electrons. Okay, so those electrons have this much free energy and they fall to a lower free energy state. Okay, I think of this like a water, like the difference between a waterfall and a dam. With a dam, a dam is really capturing, okay, so water is here and it would fall to here straight down and then go farther down. Well, if we put a dam in here, now we capture that fall of water. We slow it down and we capture that and we get energy out. Otherwise, like the Niagara Falls, that water's just falling. There's not, that energy's all being given up all at once. So we use a dam to capture that fall of energy. A protein electron transport chain is kind of like how a, a dam it captures the fall of these electrons, captures the energy. The chain uses the energy from the falling electrons, and here's where we're going to get a little chemistry science-y for a minute, and we'll come back to this a lot in the next couple weeks, to pump protons, hydrogen ions, across a membrane from low concentration to high. These protons then diffuse back through something called ATP synthase, which creates ATP. So what I've given you here is the actual how it actually works. Okay, so um, this picture is of something called ATP synthase. ATP synthase is found in cells. It's a little motor. And as these little hydrogen ions pass through the motor, it spins. And I have a hard time showing spinning, so I'm going to do that. It spins. Kind of like in a dam. A t when, a, when the water falls through the dam, the turbine spins, generating electricity. In this case, the spinning of the turbine, the energy of the spinning turbine, turbine is used to put a phosphorus compound and attach it to ADP to make ATP. So you go from ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to the higher energy, the high energy bond right there, ATP. The energy for making this bond is from the motion of the ATP synthase. That's where the energy comes from. Where did that energy come from? Well, remember, now let's go back. That energy came from the fall of electrons down the electron transport chain is used to put these protons. These protons got here because they were taken from one place and pumped to another. The energy of that pumping, and again, this is kind of, we're a little bit ahead of where we're going to be. Then they fall or diffuse back down through this little motor. Okay, so to recap, 
electron chains capture energy of falling electrons and use that energy to make ATP. Electron transport chains exist in all organisms. In the case of plants and animals, they exist in both places, a chloroplast and a plant, mitochondria and animals and plants. Electrons are put in here, they fall to a lower state. Okay, we're going to just say fall, even though they're not really falling. That energy is used to pump out protons into the other side of the membrane so they can diffuse back through. Now we're using a few terms that we haven't used before, and we'll use them, we will use them in class a little bit later. Okay, so they're pumped out, diffuse back through. This is a diagram of the ATP synthase thing that spins and creates ATP. So that's a summary of electron transport chains.